Hi everyone, it's Nicole and today I'm bringing you a recommendations video. So this is going to be another installment of the video series Who Picked These Recs where I recommend books to you from a certain genre, certain trope, whatever you would like. So if you have a favorite trope or genre that you want to hear some recommendations from me, go ahead and put that in the comments below and I will definitely put that on the list. I do have some from the previous video that I did. I think I'm going to do like a little spinning wheel. Um, I just recently downloaded that app because I did get a lot of recommendations on the last video that I did because it was kind of hard to pick which genre to do next. So I'm going to do one of those little spinny things and make it be random so I don't have to think too much about it. <laughs> How I picked this video is I literally just looked at the first genre or trope that was recommended to me from the last video and that was historical. I'm going to break this video up into historical romance and historical fiction. So if you're coming to me for recommendations and you don't necessarily read romance, I do have some non-romance historicals to recommend as well. But of course I'm going to start with romance because I am who I am. <laughs> So the first book I'm going to recommend to you for historical romance is Stranger in My Arms by Lisa Kleypas. This was the first ever Lisa Kleypas book I have ever read. No matter how many books I read by Lisa Kleypas, this is continuing to be my favorite. It's just one of those books that I just think about certain lines and certain passages constantly. And I probably read this book four or five times. I absolutely adore it. So in this book, we have Lady Laura Hawksworth. She has been widowed for a year. Her husband was lost at sea and she has been basically living her best life. She did not have the best of marriage. It was very cold, passionless. She began to really hate the thought and the action of having sex to try to procreate because really all that Lord Hawksworth wanted from her was to bear children. So she is, you know, living the good life, being single and doing what she wants and nobody telling her what to do and not having to live in that kind of stressful environment. She really loves all of her charities. She does work with children at um, the local orphanage. She does all that she can for them. And really she is just loving her life that way. She feels like the best she can do is to provide and help her community in that way. And Lord Hawksworth wasn't physically abusive to her, like he never hit her, um, but he was very verbally abusive and emotionally abusive. And honestly, like she, I guess you can, he, you can say that he was physically abusive because she just dreaded having to have sex with him. And consent was very much an issue just because she felt like it was her duty as a wife to perform that way. And that was back in the time where wives couldn't say no, but she most certainly did not want it. So definitely trigger warnings for that. None of that is graphic or on page, but it is mentioned. So like I said, she's out there living her best life and she gets the news that her husband is not actually dead. He has made his way back to her from being lost at sea for over a year and she thinks this is not possible. Hunter is dead. There's no way that I can go back to that kind of situation. There's no way. She even goes so far as to think that he is just some sort of troubled individual that wants money or mentally troubled. So she talks to the servants is like, you know, we'll find out who this individual is. We'll help them the best they can, but there's no way that this can be my husband. No way. She's out in the bow. One of the servants comes to her and says that Lord Hawksworth is in the house. Like he wants you to, you know, come and so you guys can reunite. And she's like freaking out. And she's like, let me go to, she's living in a little cottage off the side of the house. She's like, let me go to my room. Let me get freshened up and I'll meet you at the bigger house. And he apparently can't wait because she's trying to mentally prepare herself um, for this kind of encounter. And he shows up at her little cottage and she turns around and he looks exactly like her husband. He's a little thinner because during his convalescing, he has lost some weight as one does being confined to a bed. And he knows things that only a husband would know. And he has like a little miniature. She had a little miniature portrait done for him when he first went off on his big adventure. And he has that with him. All of this points to the fact that Laura cannot turn away from the fact that this man is her husband and he has come back and she is back in that situation of having a loveless, harsh marriage. But in the regards that he physically looks like her husband and knows all these things that only her husband would know, he is also very much different. He is not the hunter that she once knew. He is very 
kind and supportive of her and gentle with her. And when it comes to their marital bed, he does not want to force her, saying he will only come to her when she wants it. He's just very loving and attentive the way that he had never been in the past. So he is very much a stranger in that regard. And Laura gets to the point where she doesn't know up from down, you know, it's just a whirlwind of the attention that he's giving her. And she's actually starting to like sex for the first time and feel passion and feel loved and cherished. And so their marriage grows from this and slowly but surely she begins to fall in love with her husband. And through this book, you get both perspectives from Laura and from Hunter. And from Hunter's perspective, you get to learn certain things and Laura's noticing certain things that aren't quite right. So you're left with the question like, is this man really Hunter, really her husband, or has she been seduced by a stranger? Next romance I'm gonna recommend to you is Indigo by Beverly Jenkins. This was the first Beverly Jenkins I've read and it is continuing to be my favorite from all of the Beverly Jenkins that I have read. So in this book, we have Hester. Um, as a child, she did escape slavery. So now as an adult, she spends her time as a member of the Underground Railroad, helping other slaves gain their freedom. One night, another conductor comes to her and begs her to hide a man that is injured. There is a very big price on this man's head because he is known as the Black Daniel. He is another vital member of the Underground Railroad, and he has helped many, many people escape the slavery of the South. He, so he is just a renowned figure in the Underground Railroad. So Hester does not hesitate. She offers him, you know, a place to convalesce. She even nurses him back to health. The Black Daniel, his real identity, his name is Galen, and he is one of a very wealthy Black family in New Orleans. And instead of just living you know, the rich life and, you know, sitting by on the sidelines, he is actively working to help others in the community and in the South. So as he's convalescing, these two grow closer together. So there's kind of like a forest proximity there. Hester is very feisty. She is very strong-willed. She is beautiful and she is intelligent. And Galen cannot help but be drawn to her. What I really, really love about this book is the banter and the connection between Hester and Galen. Like I said, Hester is so feisty. Both of them are very stubborn and he just loves that she talks back to him and is not this meek little woman that he's used to. And he is just unapologetically attracted to her and lets her know and wants her and his thoughts towards her. And when they actually do become sexually involved, it is steamy, it is off the charts steamy. The pacing, it can be quite slow at some points, but I was never once bored while reading this book. You get that tension and you get that angst and honestly that is what fueled me to keep reading and turning page after page because I wanted that point where everything just snaps and they succumb to their emotions and their feelings and it does it does not disappoint it's so so good and you might actually learn something about the underground railroad in that time in the south next romance i'm going to recommend to you is never seduce a scott by maya banks in this book we have evelyn and she is fiercely loved and protected by her clansmen and the rest of her family but to outsiders she is considered a little bit touched, daft, um, but nobody knows, not even her family knows that she is actually deaf. When she was younger, she had an accident and she could no longer hear. Um, she has taught herself to read lips, but she prefers everybody to just think that she's daft and leave her alone and let her go about her own life. However, one day there is an arranged marriage negotiated to a rival clan to kind of negotiate peace. And that is where Graham Montgomery comes into the story. Evelyn knows that this is her duty, like she needs to do this for her clan because there needs to be peace. And so she accepts it. And when she meets Graham for the first time, his voice is so low and deep that she can actually hear him when he's talking. And this is something that is just miraculous to her. So from Graham's point of view, he's intrigued by Evelyn. Very, She's very mysterious to him. She, He's obviously heard about the rumors that are going around 
that she is daft, but he soon realizes that she's not daft. She's actually very intelligent and he soon figures out that she can't hear. Like she doesn't even have to tell him. He figures it out. So in their situation, they're getting closer, obviously, but just like with any man in romance, um, it takes a very life or death situation for him to realize his true feelings for his wife. And that comes in the forms of another rival clan who threaten Evelyn and Graham will move heaven and hell itself to protect his wife. And that's when he realizes that he cannot live without her. The next romance I'm recommending is The Outlaw and the Lady by Lorraine Heath. In this book, we have Angela, and the book opens with her walking around at night in her local town's square, and she walks into the middle of a bank robbery. So bank robbers, they know, like, she can identify them, so they kidnap her and take her with them when they hightail it out of town. That's where Lee Raven comes into the story. He's actually one of the men robbing the bank um, for more noble reasons than one might think. He is a very notorious outlaw and he realizes that you know, Angela is a witness and decides to kidnap her. What he doesn't realize is that, yeah, she walked in on the bank robbery, but she can't see anything. She's blind. Once they get to know each other, their secrets come out. Angela realizes that even though she's falling in love with him, they can't really have a life together. It just seems impossible. And Lee doesn't want to let her go. There are so many different plot lines and twists and turns in this book. Honestly, when you think you have it figured out, something else is thrown from left field and really keeps you on your toes. I really like the captive captor situation um, in this book, the author does it extremely well. Angela and Lee's chemistry just really comes off the page and their romance is very, very spoony. Next romance I'm going to recommend is To Pleasure a Lady by Nicole Jordan. In this book, we have Marcus Pierce, who is strikingly handsome, very, very wicked, and he inherits guardianship over Arabella and her two younger sisters. Realizing that guardianship over these three are going to cramp his lifestyle, he says he's going to marry them off immediately. And Arabella wants nothing to do with that. She she has sworn off marriage and men. She just wants to live her life. She actually works and runs and owns a finishing school for young girls. And she wants to just put her focus and time on that. She doesn't want a man. She doesn't want marriage. And she doesn't want that life for her younger sisters either. She wants them to do whatever they want to do. They She doesn't want a man to rule over them. And Marcus, who really has never met anyone like Arabella before, she is very feisty. She speaks her mind and not like any women of the ton that he has ever come into contact with. So that definitely intrigues him. And he realizes like, I want you. I want you in my bed. Like you must be mine kind of thing. And so they come to some sort of bargain. Uh, in two weeks, if she can resist his charms and his advances and his attempts to woo her, she and her sisters will be granted their independence and he will kind of just wash his hands of them and they will be independent and they can live on their own and run their own lives. So obviously she can't she can't pass up a deal like that. She thinks she has this in the bag. She's like, you know what? I've been doing this my whole life. I can totally resist you. But Arabella hasn't met anyone like Marcus before either. There is definitely this undeniable chemistry and spark between them and the tension between these two while they have their own battle of wills is scorching. Really, really enjoyed this book, and I don't really hear people uh, talk about it on BookTube at all, so wanted to bring it to your attention. The next romance I want to recommend to you is the Girl Meets Duke series by Tessa Dare. I am sure you've heard all about this series on BookTube. Um, I just want to reiterate that it is fantastic. The first book is called The Duchess Deal. And honestly, from page one, this book made me laugh out loud. So in this book, we have Emma. She was a vicar's daughter. And when she grew up, she went on her own and she is now a seamstress. She was making this elaborate wedding dress and it's costing her a fortune. And the bride that she was making it for she has called off the wedding and she refuses to pay for the dress so what does she do she goes to the root of the problem she goes to the man who the bride broke everything off with and she goes in this wedding dress she's like look at this dress I spent 
lots of time, lots of energy on this dress and I need to be paid for it. So you can pay for it or I'm not leaving kind of thing. And that is when our male protagonist comes into play, uh, the Duke of Ashbury. He has come back from the war scarred and suffering from post-traumatic stress. And that is why his former fiance broke everything off. So he is anything but sweet. He is brooding and glowering and he doesn't want anything to do with the ton in London. But unfortunately, he's a duke and he needs to marry and have an heir. And at this point in time, he doesn't believe in love anymore. And so when Emma shows up on his doorstep wearing a wedding dress, he's like, you'll do. He has terms and conditions of this of this marriage. It will be, you know, by night only lights off, will not be able to see me kind of thing. No questions at all about his scars, his time at the war. He doesn't want to talk about it. And as soon as she's pregnant with his heir, they need never to share a bed again. Those are his terms. And Emma, she takes the Duke up on his offer. And Emma, she knows that as a seamstress, she's barely getting by. And being the wife of a duke can mean so much for her shop, her independence, and livelihood. So, but she's not a pushover. She has terms of her own. She wants them to have dinner every night. They, she wants them to talk and have at least a kind of friendship if they're only going to have a marriage of convenience for the heir kind of thing. Because in her mind, marriage is forever and she doesn't want to be kind of stuck in that a loveless marriage where she doesn't even communicate with her husband. What I love about this book is that Emma is so funny. It's definitely like a grumpy sunshine kind of thing because she is like a ray of light. And during their dinners and their conversation, she teases him and calls him different like little endearments that he kind of puts off that it gets on his nerves and he's all growly, but you can tell that he thinks it's hilarious. And honestly, they're just, they're just so cute. All right, so we're moving on to the fiction side of this recommendation video. And the first historical fiction I want to recommend is The Nightingale by Kristen Hanna. This book is told in dual perspectives of two sisters living in Nazi-occupied France during World War II. These two sisters are very different and they both take very different roles in the war against the Nazis. First, we have Isabel. She's very young. She's very fiery, kind of a daredevil when going on her missions around France. And then we have Vienne. I think that's how you say her name. She is a mother and a wife and she is trying desperately to protect her family. What I really enjoyed about this book is that you see World War II in kind of a different light from a woman's point of view, from the women who were fighting and doing their part in the war. And it's told so beautifully and so heartbreakingly. And even though these two sisters, their fights are very different, but you can still see both of their strengths and resilience. And this book is definitely a tearjerker, so have tissues at the ready. Next historical fiction book I have is Snowflower and the Secret Fan by Lisa C. This book takes place in 19th century China, where we follow Lily, who at the age of seven is paired with a Laotong, and it means old same or friends for life. It's a part of the culture where you are bonded to another girl to be kind of friends for, for forever, like kindred spirits, and you kind of become sisters essentially. And Lily's Laotong, her name is Snowflower. And how Snowflower introduces herself to Lily, she sends her a fan, a silk fan, and she has painted a poem in Nushu. Nushu is a language that was created by Chinese women um, to, as a way to communicate and speak freely without the influence of the men surrounding them. So it is a language just known by women. And you get their story, you get their entire, you know, life and friendships, their ups and downs, they write each other, they write these messages to each other on fans, on handkerchiefs, you know, they're, they're sharing their hopes, their dreams, what they think are their failures, their struggles as they embark on marriage and motherhood. And these two girls, they really find solace in each other. And no matter what is going on in their everyday lives, you know, with their husbands and their children, and they just know that whatever's going on in their life, they are each other's solid foundation and they can always go back and find solace in each other. As the years go on, something happens. There's a misunderstanding, miscommunication, and it threatens to tear them apart. 
what I really enjoyed about this book is that it is beautifully, beautifully written. Honestly, it's just, it's pure poetry. Um, again, bring the tissues because you will be crying and just learning different things about the Chinese culture. It was very beautiful. The next historical fiction I want to recommend is Devil in the White City by Eric Larson. This book is told in two different perspectives in 1893 during the Chicago World Fair. We follow one man whose name is Daniel. He is the architect who was responsible for the construction of the fair. And then the second man we have is H.H. Holmes. He was a serial killer during that time masquerading as a doctor. The two different perspectives in this book are kind of jarring because on the one hand you just have the architect who is just thinking about how to build this fair and make it a success. You also have different appearances by figures like Susan B. Anthony and Thomas Edison. Those areas are just rich with history but also kind of dry. What really drove this book for me is H.H. H. Holmes's point of view. So he is believed to be responsible for a number of different murders that were happening during the time of the Chicago World Fair. He devised and built the World Fair Hotel that was near the fairgrounds and he used the hotel as means to get his next victims. In this hotel he had a gas chamber, he had a crematorium, and so it was very much a hotel of horrors that he used the World Fair to his advantage to get his new victims. And it was also known that he was very charming. He was very charismatic. So he used that to lure in victims as well. These two different perspectives, it doesn't seem like they would work, but they do. And honestly, it almost reads as nonfiction. But although the Chicago World Fair did happen and H.H. H. Holmes was a known serial killer during that time, that is about all of what is true in this book. Everything else that is embellished by the author is, you know, a work of fiction, but it's very, it's done very, very well. The next historical fiction book I want to recommend is Rainwater by Sandra Brown. This book takes place in Texas in the 1930s and in this book we follow Ella. She runs a boarding house while she takes care of her 10 year old son. Reading this book I feel he's on the autism spectrum but people really didn't know what to call it back in the day. He's very sweet and very bright. He's busy. He always constantly wants to be doing something but he does not speak. He will not speak, not even to his own mother. So one day a room opens up in her boarding house and a doctor, the local doctor, brings in a man by the name of David Rainwater. Um, she's kind of hesitant to open up her house to this stranger. She doesn't know him. He's new in town, very wary of him, but the doctor vouches for him, you know, saying he is a good man. He has impeccable character. He is just, you know, down on his luck, you know, because of the Great Depression. She still is kind of wary about taking him in but the doctor confides in her the fact that he won't need a room for very long because he's actually dying. She does take pity on him and he eventually moves in to the room that she has available in her boarding house. You know as he's living there they do get to know each other and they do develop feelings for one another even though Ella knows that it can't possibly last after all he is dying. This is a book that is so beautifully written as well. Sandra Brown, she is one of my favorites. I talk about Sandra Brown a lot on my channel. The relationship between Ella and David and also her son is just so, it's so, so beautiful. And even as the reader, you know it can't last. You can't help but root for them. This is also a book that's going to make you cry. So bring those tissues. Have them handy. So that is it. Those are all of my recommendations. If you've read any of these books, let me know in the comments. I would love to discuss them with you. If you do take my recommendations and you read one of this book, um, let me know what you think of them. I would, I would honestly love to know if you enjoy them or not. And also don't forget to let me know a certain genre or trope you'd like to see me recommend books from. Don't forget to like my video if you did, comment below, and subscribe to my channel. You can follow me on all the social media platforms. The links will be in the description box below. We'll see you next time, Avid Readers!